One of the things I love about Foundation is making maps and exploring new maps. I've made a lot of custom maps over the years, many of which have special features. For example, I've dabbled in building tropical maps, desert maps, maps with an arid climate, maps that have animals roaming free, for instance, wild cattle. I've also experimented with my own vegetation and my own mineral deposits. With the release of Foundation's random map generator, it opens up the opportunity for me to stop making so many custom maps and instead make mods which modify the randomly generated maps to my liking. For example, instead of building a custom desert map, what I can do is leverage the existing random generator, change the vegetation and the textures of the map to match my desert theme. So I've been busy over the last week or two making a new set of mods which modify existing maps. So today I'm going to walk you through how each of these map modifying mods works. So before I show each mod, what I wanted to do is a quick overview of the two different types of mods that I've created. The first two are called Realistic Stone and Realistic Berries. And what these do is they convert the stone and berry locations that the vanilla game generates into something more realistic. So for example, the stone, instead of being a single deposit, which is inexhaustible, it becomes multiple deposits of scattered stones and the stones are exhaustible. So when they're used up, you have to expand your territory to gain new stone deposits. However, I've still left the quarries as infinite stone. So you can still have an infinite supply of stone once you've established a stone quarry. For berries, I just split up the berry bushes so that they're not all together and I also place individual berry bushes on the map. Those are two mods which simply make it a little bit more realistic to gather those initial resources. The other type of mod that I've created are what I'm calling map converters. So these are the ones that replace all of the vegetation on the map, and I'm gonna show you each of these in turn. So here we have a randomly generated map. Currently, there are no settings on the randomly generated maps except for the type of terrain. So you can't change the type of trees or any parameters of the map. I'm sure those features are coming. So what you get is a fairly hilly map with lots of deciduous trees. I don't think there's any pine trees that spawn in the random map generator today. Of course, you get the normal stone and berry deposits. So what I've done is I've saved this map at the beginning before I make any changes and I'm going to reload it with each of my map converter mods in turn. So here I am in the load game menu, and instead of just loading my save, I'm going to click edit mods, and I'm going to add a map converter. The first one I'll do is the simplest, the alpine map converter, which simply converts all the trees to pines. So here we are in that map, and as you can see, all the trees have been converted to pines. They're in their same original locations. The only major change as I go through the code is I may thin out the trees because the map generator tends to place up to 60,000 trees on the map, which is, in my opinion, overkill, especially from a performance perspective. So I tend to limit the number of trees placed to 20 or 30,000 when I replace them. So even though I've done that, you can see that the forest is still quite thick. So that's a nice option and a simple option if you're just looking for more of an alpine look, if you're looking for that mountainous or high altitude look. Next up, we have the arid map converter. So this one is interesting because it basically removes a lot of the trees. It thins out the trees that remain. It converts them all to deciduous. It makes them shorter so they look more stunted due to the low rainfall. It changes the grass texture, so you can see that the texture of the grass is browner. The trees themselves are also browner. It adds some bushes and saplings, so some small trees and bushes to give more variety to the landscape. So this would be something like a Mediterranean climate perhaps, or if you're looking for kind of a North Africa feel or a savanna type feel, this would be more along those lines. This is inspired by a map I made a long time ago called Karabulak, which was to simulate the steppes of maybe Eastern Europe or different places like that. Obviously it's very hilly here, but the idea is that it looks more dry. And I've also added what I call a grass inhibitor. So it's an object which shortens the grass and you can see that the grass is a little more patchy than it is in vanilla and it's quite a bit shorter. So that makes it also appear a little bit more arid. This is a great map converter if you don't like the huge forests that you often get with vanilla maps and if you want more space for building right off the bat. 
but it does change the look and feel of the game quite a bit. Next up is the polar opposite, which is the tropical map converter. So as you would expect, this converts all the trees to palm, date, and cane trees. It replaces the grass texture with a darker, more mottled texture, which would be typical of a tropical location. And I highly recommend combining this mod with the mud mod to make the ground look more tropical, kind of that red soil look that you would get in the tropics. This would be great for any kind of map trying to replicate some of the wetter Atlantic islands, parts of Africa, more of a late medieval kind of colonial look. And I really like tropical maps myself. It just gives that much more variety to the experience. It's really fun to have the buildings being built underneath the shade of the palm and date trees. Now, if you've played any of my other tropical maps, you know that I have these date trees, which act as berry bushes in most of those mods. In this example, these date trees are simply a variation of a theme, so they can be cut down for wood. And the same is true of the cane trees. In this mod, I also have added flowers, so a few tropical flowers around the understory just to give a bit of added vegetation. So the tropical trees are fairly performant, but they aren't quite as good performance as the vanilla trees because of the number of fronds on the palm trees. So this is not a great map if you have a low-end computer. probably want to avoid the tropical maps that have lots of forests. So I've worked hard to make desert maps, and this is the desert map converter. It takes advantage of some code that I built earlier this year, which basically creates an irrigation mechanism. So as you can see, parts of the map are green and fertile, and the rest are barren. And it's based on elevation. So the closer to the water you are, the better the soil will be, and then it quickly transitions to a desert. And if you're familiar with any of my other desert maps that I've released, especially Sahara Jamila, you'll know that you can build irrigation towers. You have to transport the water from the water's edge to the irrigation tower, and you can have irrigation workers basically irrigating the desert and removing the inhibitors that stop the grass from growing there. And another unfortunate side effect, but it is a side effect, is that houses will not spawn in the desert, so they'll only spawn in the irrigated areas. To expand your housing, you either need to irrigate or you can use any of the housing mods, which allow you to manually place the houses. Now this map in particular, there isn't a lot of green space immediately. Some flatter maps you'll get a lot more green space, but this really replicates the kind of idea that you might get along the Nile, and you'll see even if the lakes are low enough in elevation, they'll also get some of that green space and trees. Now in this desert map, you do get the date trees. So the berries have been replaced and the berries are gone. And now you have to gather the dates or berries from the date trees and you can plant these as well. So the forester can plant these. So one of the first things to do in a desert map is typically that you'll build a forester's hut and start to populate some of the green space along the rivers with date trees that you can harvest the dates from. Obviously you have other modded food sources as well at the beginning of the game like poultry and vegetables, which I highly recommend. I'm a personal huge fan of desert maps. I think it adds a lot of interest to have to deal with the water situation. Um, one thing to note about desert maps in this map converter is that it does require you to get the water from the water's edge, so you can't build a well in the middle of the desert, which is obviously much more realistic. So you have to place your wells at the edge of the water, and you can transport and store the water. So you can store it in granaries, you can sell it in a market, and that's how you can get the water from where it is to, let's say if you built a town up here in the interior, you could transport the water from the water's edge and store it in a granary and sell it in your market, just like you can any other food. And that will allow you to expand your water considerably. But it also means that you have to carefully make sure that you have enough wells to constantly supply all of your farms and people with water. This one is also one of my favorites. It's the temperate map converter. And at first glance, it doesn't look like much has changed, but actually there's quite a bit going on here. So let me walk you through the features of this map converter. The trees are mostly deciduous, so at lower elevations they are deciduous, and then as you go up in elevation, you'll see more and more pine trees. And at high elevations there will be entirely pine trees. So you can see up here it's completely pine. So I've added 
more variety in terms of the climactic zones of the topography. I've also added different kinds of bushes, different kinds of saplings, which are just small trees, and also flowers scattered around. And for the flowers, I've also added a small grass inhibitor around the flowers to make there be a little more variation in the height of the grass. I've also slightly changed the grass texture so it's not quite as green and it's not quite as blocky in terms of being a single color. Now, in terms of actual gameplay changes, there really aren't any. So the flowers don't do anything. They're just decorative. They just appear. And for performance reasons, they don't appear far away. So you have to be a little bit close to the grass to see the flowers. Uh, all the trees and bushes and saplings can be removed for wood. There's no changes to the forester. And there's no changes to berries or anything like that. So it's very much vanilla inspired, but just a bit more decorative and a bit more variation to make the trees and forests look more interesting. The final map converter is called the Fancy Map Converter, and that's because it uses the vegetation from another modder, Arthos, and his Fancy Nature Pack. So the Fancy Nature set is quite different from vanilla. If you look at the trees, they have a lot of individual leaves. It's more similar perhaps to some other RTS games or, or even the Settlers series. A lot more detail in the trees, although he's done a good job of making sure that these trees are still quite performant. They're, even though they look complicated, these are not really hugely complicated geometries. And what I've done in this mod converter is I'm using his trees at low elevations. You get birch and beech trees. So here's the little birch trees, and there he has lots of different varieties of each species, so it makes the forest look really varied. And as you go up in elevation, you get oak trees, which are a bit shorter, but again, there's multiple variants of the oak trees, so you get lots of different variety in terms of how the trees look. And I've added his flowers, so you can see scattered through the landscape, there are different kinds of flowers. And those will, similar to the temperate map converter, those are just for decoration. So then I get through the oak forest, and as I get higher, I will get into the pine and fir. So you can see here, I'm starting to see more fir trees and pine trees. And at high elevations, then it will be entirely fir and pine. Next, I'm going to show you my two realistic resource mods, realistic stones and realistic berries. So I've loaded this map up with the temperate map converter. So I'm getting the flowers, the bushes, and the saplings, and the different levels of tree cover. But now I have realistic stone and berries loaded as well. So you can already see that over here, my stone deposits have completely changed. So where every stone deposit was located before, now you'll get kind of a scattering of random stones, which can be still harvested for stone. Over some time after you've depleted them, they disappear. So each stone, I think, is worth 20 or 30 resources. Once you've harvested it, it's gone. So you'll need to continually expand to new territories until you get a stone quarry. So once you've prospected a stone quarry, those are still infinite, so that will provide you an infinite amount of stone. I also have scattered through the landscape just erratic stones here and there, so one-off stones, just to add a bit more variety to the landscape. And in terms of berry bushes, it's the same. So the berry bushes now are a little more scattered. They're not all in one big clump. Wherever there was a berry bush set before, you'll get four or five berry bushes. And you'll also find berry bushes scattered individually throughout the landscape. So here's some. You'll get red berries and blueberries, but they're the same berry resource. So I like that because it adds a lot more variety to the landscape. You can already see with the addition of the temperate landscape, I have a lot more going on here. I have the flowers, I have saplings and bushes, I have the berry bushes scattered throughout, the stones scattered throughout. So it's just, it makes for a much more interesting landscape in terms of the variety and the detail. And it's not too heavy on performance. So all of these models are similar to vanilla. They're very basic, I would call, geometry. There's not a lot of vertices and not a lot of new textures. In fact, all of the textures that I use for coloring the vegetation are vanilla textures, so there's no need to allocate more memory to those textures. So this would be kind of my favorite combination, would be the temperate along with the realistic stone and berries, and that gives you a really nice detailed map with a lot more interest than in vanilla.
This final thing that I'm going to show you today is not yet released, but it should be soon once I've had a chance to test it. This is a change to the basic materials mod, which those of you familiar with my mods will know gives you the opportunity to get clay and thatch and use those as building materials. So most of the basic buildings in the game would require clay and thatch. And it's something that you need to start harvesting right away at the beginning of the game because you're going to need to build houses. Now I do give clay and thatch resources at the beginning of the game, but once you're getting beyond the first set of four or five houses, you'll need to get clay and thatch. And the way I'm doing this in Basic Materials 2.0, so to speak, is instead of placing those resources, so instead of placing the reeds or placing a clay pit where you can get access to clay from anywhere, you now have to actually go and gather those resources. And it was a lot of fun for me to figure out how to make this work. So obviously I'm having to scan the entire map and find waterside locations and make sure that the reeds spawn in the right depth of water and land. And what you do is you build the thatcher's yard just as you would before, but the thatchers will go to the nearest reeds and gather the reeds from there to make thatch. And the same is true of the clay pit. You build the clay pit anywhere, but the workers will find the nearest clay and harvest it from there. And these resources are replenishing, so if you cut down all these reeds, you would have to go find another reed deposit, but they will grow back over time. And the same is true of clay. If you use up all the immediately available clay, you may have to go visit another deposit, but this will eventually replenish. And I've made these deposits throughout the map, so there should be about 30 clay deposits around the map, and the reeds should spawn in numerous locations. There's about two and a half thousand reeds, individual reeds, that spawn throughout the map. So depending on the map, of course, it's the location may be inconvenient to your village. So you need to look around at the beginning of the game and just make sure that there are reeds or clay relatively close to your village if you want to be efficient. Obviously, it's fine if your workers travel. There's no need for an extraction zone, and so they can travel anywhere on the map to get the clay or the reeds. Oh, this is one other feature I forgot to mention in my temperate mod pack, is that the temperate map converter is that it does spawn these lily pads in the water. So without an extraction zone, it shouldn't be an issue to find clay and thatch, but you may want to look around and make sure that it's relatively close by, especially thatch, because clay will spawn on the land. So you can see here's a couple of clay deposits further inland, but the thatch will only spawn on the water's edge. Now, if you don't have any water on your map, then it will spawn on land. So you'll see the thatch spawning or the reeds spawning on flat locations further inland, mostly at low elevations. But if you do have a normal map with lots of water, all the reeds will be on the water's edge. So you need to make sure either that your initial village is close to the water or that you are willing to have your thatch workers travel to the reeds and pick them up where they are. But here's another lake and you can see the reed deposits here. So I was quite happy with that. It was a technical challenge to figure out how to spawn these in a realistic way. And I had to go through lots of iterations to figure out how to do it. But it was a lot of fun once I did get it to work. And I think it looks quite well. I mean, obviously it would be fun to have reeds along longer stretches of rivers, maybe for more realism. But from a performance perspective, that's a bad idea. These reeds are very simple. They're just two planes kind of pasted together. But you wouldn't want to have, you know, more than a couple thousand of these on a map. It just from a performance perspective, it's going to slow down the game. So I opted for more widely scattered, but still very accessible reed deposits. And for the clay as well, I'm trying to limit those to locations where clay would make more sense. So you're not going to see clay spawning on a steep mountainside or at high elevations. The clay is all going to be at low elevations and it's going to be on relatively flat ground where clay would be more likely to accumulate from the detritus of plants decaying over time. So those are some changes to the basic materials mod. So combined with the map converters, you get a lot more variety in the landscape in terms of the resources. And if you play with basic materials, you now get a lot more variety in terms of having to be realistic about your location of your village. And I really like these changes. I think they're going to add just that little bit of decorative gameplay 
kind of similar to the stumps mod where you have stumps that that remain after you cut down a tree. So I like these little visual touches because they just make the gameplay a little bit more immersive as you're moving around the world. One last sneak peek of something else that I have in development is a change to the Pagan Worship mod. So those of you familiar with that mod will know that you can place various objects in the landscape which allow your villagers to worship outside of the churches. The idea with the new version of Pagan Worship is that most of the Pagan Worship happens at sites which the player does not place. So instead of placing a sacred spring, for example, there will actually be one or two sacred springs in the landscape. And your villagers will be able to go visit those at the beginning of the game before their church is built. This is an example of a auto-spawned sacred spring which a villager might visit to satisfy their religious need. And the idea would be that these are pretty rare, so you'd only have capacity for maybe 20, 20 or 30 villagers at the beginning of the game. And of course, if you don't build a church, the villagers are going to have to travel a long distance to find the nearest pagan worship site. So it's not going to be efficient from a game perspective and economy perspective. But it will add some interest and variety and kind of like a little shrine almost where the villagers will visit these. And I'm just marking them right now because I'm testing this functionality, marking them with these white cubes so I can tell where they are. And with this, I'm again looking for very flat land, so they only spawn where it's really flat because the spring doesn't look right if it's on a really steep mountainside. I'm experimenting with different things, so I think I'm going to have a sacred spring. I'm going to have kind of a sacred tree, so like a giant oak tree. And I might also have a scaled down version of my volcano. Although I haven't decided whether every pagan worship map will have a volcano, because not every map would be suitable for a volcano. There is some issues with this functionality at the moment. It actually causes a crash the way that I've implemented it now, but I think I'll be able to overcome that at some point and release this change as the new pagan worship mod. So I'm really looking forward to that. I've always thought it was a bit odd that you could place a volcano <laughs> or build a volcano, so to speak. So this will give a little bit more interest and realism to the Pagan Worship mod. I do still plan on having placeable Pagan Worship sites. So it's going to be a monument of different parts. So standing stones, uh, stone circle, those kinds of things. So you can build your own Stonehenge or stone circle. So that will still be possible and you'll still be able to build your own Pagan Worship temples. But it'll be more interesting because you won't be just placing the entire Stonehenge monument. You'll actually be building it piece by piece, which will be more fun, I think. And again, it'll make it more realistic that the natural worship sites like springs and volcanoes will not be placeable by the player, but that the temples, which would be buildable by people, those will be things that you can design in place. So I think it'll be a big improvement to the mod and make it much more in keeping with how pagan worship would actually have occurred. So just a quick sneak preview of that mod, and hopefully I can get that finished here in the next couple of weeks, depending on resolution of some of those bugs that I've raised with the developers. So thanks for watching today. I hope that you've enjoyed some of these new mods and that you are experimenting with them. Please let me know in the comments of any new features or ideas that you have, and we'll go from there. Thank you very much.